Today on Triumph Talks, I'm talking again with John Peace about his Amazon best-selling book, A Boy from Cracker's Neck, which features the stories he was told by his papa, who was a B-17 bomber pilot. In the last episode, we learned about Operation Gamora, where the Allied Air Force ran a total warfare campaign targeting the civilians of Hamburg, Germany, and how the men assigned to those missions felt about it, both before and after. Today's topic is also on the darker side as we discuss what has been labeled Black Thursday. So typically when these Air Force crews were assigned missions, they they did it in a rotation, um, according to your book, which is that um, the bomber crews would be assigned either to go at night or uh, in the daytime, and the missions would be different. But the generals determined that they wanted to make a big dent in the German military complex by bombing the ball bearing plants located around Schweinfurt, Bavaria, with the full force of the bomber groups of the 8th Air Force. So that's where this chapter begins. Well, thanks for having me on here. You know, pro- as you said earlier, the, the chapter Gomorrah and then this chapter Black Thursday was probably the two most important operations in my grandfather's life that affected him the rest of his life. And I'm sure the rest of his crew, and I'm sure any other people that, that flew in the eighth air force, if they lived through these two missions, um, you know, they were devastating for him, not only, um, through casualties, through the people they lost, um, uh, mentally just having to live through them and live through what the destruction and the loss of life, loss of comrades, um, it, it yeah, it affected him the rest of his life. Right. So then with this new mission, of course, Operation Gamora was the total warfare mission. Yeah. This one was a little different because they were all going at once. So instead of being in a rotation, they're sent them all at one time, which is, if you think about it, it was kind of a big gamble. And um, so, and we know that maybe the gamble didn't work out quite the way we hoped because of the name of this mission or the name of this event becoming Black Thursday. So yeah, can you share um, kind of yeah. what happened when they put the full force of their um, all their bomber crews out at once? Yep. What the military brass didn't know was by the summer of 1943, and this is early in the war for the Americans, bombing raids in the area by the British Royal Air Force had led the Germans to establish an early warning radar line of towers along with increasing the number of fighter aircraft and anti-aircraft artillery flak towers around the ball bearing plants. Line and weight were 300 Luftwaffe fighter pilots with some of the most experienced pilots the Germans had to offer. And you got to remember, when we say experienced Germans, they'd already been fighting for two years, some of them three. So this was the best of the best the Germans had. And this was early in the war for the Americans, so they were still very inexperienced and, and... um, they thought by sheer might and numbers that they would overwhelm um, the Germans. Yeah. And as you say in the book, the, the military brass didn't know that they now had this early warning system. So they, no. they didn't have the advantage that they were used to having. Um, it took them about an hour to get all of the crews up into the air, all of the, the flying fortresses, and uh, headed over. So Jimmy, your papa, was mm-hmm. actually the leader of the 332nd 332 squadron of the 94 bomber group. So he was actually kind of important um, as a leader in this mission. Yeah, a a little bit of this is where he entered into um, um, the Air Force already being a pilot. So so he was a little bit ahead ahead of a lot of other people that they were just learning how to be a pilot. And, um, you know, on this particular mission, you know, they sent everybody up. And also, um, you know, we put in there, there was, there was all over a hundred P 47 Thunderbolt. So you can imagine, you know, there's almost 300 bombers, another hundred fighter planes, you know, when they got in the air, I mean that you had to feel a little bit invincible just by sheer yeah. numbers. Going into it, they probably yeah, felt, going into good. It. but, but that didn't last long. So the P 17 Thunderbolts um, could only f- escort the bombers to the German border. Um, before they ran out of fuel. So they didn't take them all the way over to, to Germany. We'll find out that um, that that's, yeah. uh, that probably changed. When 
Probably that, when I put it in there, they didn't like run out of fuel and drop out of the air. That was just as far as they could go to right. get Right. Yeah. Back. No, no. That yeah. makes sense. They wouldn't have <laughs> yeah. enough fuel to get back. So that's yeah. as far as they could it, take They went any further. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what happened to these, these crews as they started to fly without their escorts and 300 Luftwaffe waiting for them? Well, as my granddad would say, this is when it kind of hit the fan. Um, they had never seen that many fighter planes. And of course, in, in these battles, he would talk about, you would get hit by the fighter planes first. And, you know, you could imagine 300 in the air, you know, just the sheer amount. He, he talked about how all you could hear was all the machine guns going mm. and the sheer and people on the radio talking about fighters coming in 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you know, coming in from all directions and stuff. And, and they could hear was, each other. Right. So there's yeah. all this chaos. Radio chatter. Yeah. Sounding, intercom so. chatter. Intercom. Yeah. yeah. Because they were trying yeah. to warn each other to, to allow other gunners to, to turn around and, and try to fight these off. And, um, like my papa said, you know, they got hit multiple times with, mm-hmm. um, you know, with um, machine gun fire from fighter planes and stuff. But, you know, going in, you know, they, they survived and they, you know, moved on into the mission and stuff. So, uh, yeah. gosh. Let me just, read a little I, bit from your book. Yeah. It says, as the B-17s flew over their targets, the ground defenses responded with an intense barrage of fire and the sky was soon filled with smoke and explosions. Despite the bravery and determination of the American airmen, the losses were staggering. Of the 291 B-17s that made up the attacking force, 80 were lost to enemy fire, and another 17 were so heavily damaged that they would never fly again. Most of the remaining planes suffered varying degrees of damage, but were repairable. These losses amounted to a devastating 25% of the attacking force. We have to keep in mind this attacking force was everybody. So that yes. mattered. The Luftwaffe, meanwhile, would only lose 38 fighters, but many of those downed pilots were able to bail out and return to duty. For the Americans, the cost was much higher. A full 20% of their air crew, a total of 650 men, were either killed or taken prisoner, while many others were wounded. The battle had been brutal and costly, and the full impact of the losses would be felt for years to come. And um, you write in here about what Jimmy, Captain Galloway, and his crew were hearing. Um, yeah, let me, let me read this. You know, Jimmy and his crew watched in horror as the wreckage of other bomber rained down to the ground. They could hear the screams over the radio. And this, you, if, if you've watched the movie Memphis Bell, they actually talked about that. Mm-hmm. And because the radios would be open because you were trying to warn other, you know, all the uh, machine gunners were the uh, pilots were coming from so you could hear them screaming and b-17s were not designed to be able to bail out of they were hard to get into oh wow yes um they were hard and even harder to get out um it was a brutal reminder of the dangers they faced every day and jimmy wasn't the only one that couldn't help but wonder if the crew of little helen would eventually eventually suffer the same fate because you know you were just losing so many you were just assuming you were the next and yeah. you know, that, that's hard to imagine been in that situation it is i mean i guess thanks to movies <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, um, like masters of the air and memphis bell and others we, we we can imagine by seeing the depiction that hollywood put together which i think in a lot of cases is fairly accurate so yes which i know i've seen a lot of those movies where you, you kind of watch a giant bomber coming down and just barely missing you or nicking your plane on its way mm-hmm. And when you think of having the full force of the 8th Air Force all flying together in close formation, and they're starting to get hit and they're starting to drop, I'm sure bombers would fall on others and take them down with them. I mean, just the sheer terror and then listening to them as they're going down. And, um, man, it is just, uh, it's quite a scene to to have lived through and then to to imagine for us. Um would you read for us a, an yeah. excerpt on page 157 from your book that sure kind of talks about how this, this, this is, you know, once, once I get back, you know, upon yeah. landing, the, the landing crew was shocked to the extent of the damage of Jimmy's plane, um, which is little Helen, the ground and repair crews later um, reported that the plane had over 300 bullet and flak holes, a testament to the dangerous conditions that Jimmy's crew faced on this particular mission. A few days after little Hel- Helen had been patched up, um, Tex made the comment, Tex being one of the airmen, 
gosh, I haven't seen this many patches since I was back home sleeping under one, one of my patch quilts back home. That The night was difficult, to say the least. Jimmy had to sleep alone in his barracks. None of the other pilots from his barracks had made it back from Black Thursday. None of his um, 332nd Squadron. That night, Jimmy realized he was not going to live through this. Surprisingly, he was at peace with this realization. The next morning, Colonel Jesse had come by to check on Jimmy. He couldn't imagine having to sleep in the whole barracks by himself. And My granddad said he was just shocked that that had happened. He had the news that Jimmy was being promoted from his um, uh, 332nd Squadron leader to the larger 94th Bomber Group leader, combining survivors of the three other squadrons into the 332nd. The new B-17 bomber crew, new B-17 bomber crews were arriving stateside following a week fresh out of flight school to fill in for other squadrons. Um, Jimmy looked at Colonel Jesse hard to take a promotion when all you did was survive. Um, yeah, probably the darkest nightmare, you know, the nightmare situation of my papa throughout the whole war was probably that night. I couldn't imagine. And these barracks weren't huge. They, they, you know, you can see pictures in the book of the barracks and stuff. Mm-hmm. There was about 25, 30 crewmen per barracks, and they were little, you know, the metal um, concha huts. But to sleep by yourself, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine that. That gives you then, a visual feel of just how great the losses were to be the only one in your barrack that got yeah. back, that came back. And, you know, to come yeah. to the self realization that, you were not going to live through this. And it was by sheer numbers. You know, when you just start seeing everybody that you knew that one coming back and you got more missions to do, I mean, one slowing down and it wasn't getting better. Um, and then he got promoted. And I, I think that yeah. says so much for him to say hard to take a promotion when all you did was survive, you know, yeah. feel good about that. Um, and, and I hope it was one thing throughout the book yeah. that, you know, there, there's not one single heroic act that I try to promote going, Hey, these are here. I mean, they literally were just doing their job and just surviving. Yeah. You know what? And, um, and my granddad would talk about that. And I think that was a little bit of survivor's remorse. Um, you know, why them, um, mm-hmm. you know, just terrible conditions. You were saying, um, as we were talking about this earlier, because the last episode, if, if, the viewers are are following in order. The last episode was Operation Gomorrah, which is where they were required to just bomb civilians. No, no mm-hmm. military asset at all. And then you were sharing that, that some of them thought maybe that the losses of Black Thursday was almost like karma or, or God punishing them. For yeah. And, it, it, and you got to go, you know, in the book, you know, which is of course speculation, had, but yes. I think it becomes important because it speaks to how they felt. Yes. You know? Because, you know, he had a Jewish crew. He was the only one there that he knew of that had a Jewish yeah. crew. Wow. And, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. And, you know, the, you know, I, I'm not a, a religious studies person and stuff. I just know the basics about Jewish religion. You know, we share a lot of the old Testament with Jews and all that, and you know, he could remember some of his his airmen, his crewmates, talking about you know Operation Gamora was three months earlier, and mm-hmm. they had, mm-hmm. first time they had bombed civilian targets, and you know some of the Jewish crewmen actually wondered um, there was a Jew. I, I, I meant to look it up. There's a so Jewish coming from the God's Jewish, revenge. So it's coming from the Jewish perspective, yes, and their understanding of what they had done and what consequences might. Yeah. be associated with that yeah and you get yeah. punished on this earth for yeah. your actions mm, okay so yeah i know it was really interesting that you that you mentioned that and of course that makes sense with him having a jewish crew that that was the conversation which yeah. i think is important for people to understand that's the conversations that they had is to say wow you know this we didn't feel good about that and then this is what what came out of it i also think it's really interesting that um there's a part in here um well, I guess we'll kind of go to the next part when, mm-hmm. um, let me read a little bit from your book. Okay. It kind of sets up an interesting, an interesting conclusion or uh, assessment, I'll call it, of this mm-hmm. mission. Um, the raid on the ball-bearing plants of Schweinfurt, Bavaria, was a turning point in the war over Europe. 
Despite their best efforts, the American bomber crews faced overwhelming opposition from the German air defenses. The loss of 60 bombers, with many others heavily damaged, was a devastating blow to the 8th Air Force. And, of course, the high loss of the air crew that we mentioned. It's a sobering reminder of the dangers of flying over enemy territory without adequate Mm -hmm. escort. The mission's outcome was a wake-up call for military leaders who now realized that bomber raids into Germany could no longer be conducted without fighter escorts. The P-47 Thunderbolts that flew escort during the raid were limited by their range and could not provide the needed protection against the huge losses. Deep bombing missions into Germany were halted until the arrival of the P-51 Mustang long-range fighters in January 1943. I just think that's really interesting that we all know about the that um, <clears throat> that group because our, our Tuskegee Airmen flew and yes. protected, and there's quite an amazing history associated with that. But I think sometimes we, we learn about um, historical war experiences in a vacuum. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. but to be able to say Black Thursday and what they learned from Black Thursday is what led to them waiting until they had the Mustangs before they would continue these kind of operations. Yeah, at least for the 8th Air Force. At least for the uh, 8th Air Force. Yeah, Yeah. now I'm I'm not sure if there was other bomb groups, the 9th and all that. If they halted or not. But the 8th Air Force was like, wait, we're going to have the the protection. (sighs) But actually, they didn't have the planes or the the personnel. (laughs) Yeah, they probably um, lost so much they had yeah. to wait for that reason as well. That's yeah. a good point. That's a really good point. Um, well, I was going to read, read this one part, and I, I was going to make a comment on it. was yeah. rumored that General Meade told his assistants, if the American public knew what happened today, they'd hang me. A lot of the mm-hmm. Air Force was killed and sent home injured from this mission. And one thing you got to keep in perspective, okay, this is 1943. We don't know about the atrocities of the Holocaust yet, okay? So – they're still very concerned about press and they're very concerned about letters getting sent home and their casualty rates because, you know, from an American perspective, you still had a a lot of people that were still questioning, you know, being in this war. Yeah. Some people would have been like, that's it. Get out of there. (laughs) Which is a good thing we didn't, you know, we couldn't have that kind of. Oh, looking back. Yes, absolutely. But this is 1943. So, I mean, we still don't know what to, what's exactly. And then to get be sending young men and GIs to get slaughtered at the rate they were getting slaughtered, um, it was concerning for the, the top brass. Yeah. But interestingly enough, those that did survive were um, awarded. And the crew, the little Helen, got to be participants in being awarded a um, medals for their bravery mm-hmm. from what they call the fat man himself. Winston Churchill, and um, he presented them with the Distinguished Flying Cross Award. So yeah. they ended up with a chest full of medals, as you yeah. call it. <laughs> and, and I really think if, even the, the British brass, whether it be Winston Churchill, they were worried about the, the ramifications of, of this story getting out. And then also, um, you know, my granddad. But do you think they gave them it. these medals as a way to kind of create some positive publicity that you know oh, look at the heroes who got all these you know got look at the americans that got a distinguished flying cross from winston yeah. churchill that might have been a little bit of a and also morale yeah and not um, to say they didn't deserve it i'm yeah. not saying that but no. not at all but but yeah and for morale although i'm sure that would have been a, a very um somber occasion you know to get medals when so much was lost and so many yeah. lives were lost and then also you had to worry about the morale of incoming. I mean, can you imagine like my papa's barracks that was empty? Okay, the new guys have to wonder where's all the other people at right. that were here. Yeah. Um, so you know that that had to be a daunting. You know how are we gonna manage this? This has been a catastrophe. You know how are we gonna manage um, the morale of the personnel? You know afterwards, and then make sure they go on that next mission. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know, you said that. something, and it's not in the book, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, you mentioned, I think, in an earlier episode, they didn't um, record or keep track of the suicide rate going After on. The war. Yeah, but but even during the wartime, were, were you saying that there was a lot of suicides just from those that that um just were or was it just after the war that that, that was an issue probably after you know my granddad I'll, you know yeah. I've, I've talked a little bit of this 
um, before. Um, my granddad always said he felt sorry for the Vietnam veterans for the way that war was fought. You know, you go on these terrible missions, do, you mm-hmm. know, terrible combat missions. Then you had a lot of R&R. And he said, I couldn't imagine having a lot of R&R to actually think about what we just went through. He said, yeah, like how restful would it really was, be? <laughs> yeah, was keep moving forward. I mean, mm-hmm. you didn't have time to reflect on who you lost because you had another mission you were getting ready for. Yeah. So, that's yeah, interesting. just an interesting that's observation. A, that's what he it's felt. It's so personally. interesting to hear the perspectives of, of one generation of soldiers yeah. and, and fighters to looking at the next generation. Would you read the last paragraph of this chapter? Be glad to. Um, And this General Arnold um, made this speech. Um, His voice got very solemn and he said he wanted to leave us with these thoughts. Um, And this is a quote from him. And it's also in the 8th Air Force Museum. He lived to bear his country's arms. He died to save its honor. He was a soldier and he knew a soldier's duty. His sacrifice will help to keep aglow the flame and torch that lights our lives, that millions of yet unborn may know the priceless job of liberty. And we who pay him homage and revere his memory and pride, rededicate ourselves to a complete fulfillment of the task to which he so gallantly has placed his life upon the altar of man's freedom. I think that's Uh, that falls in the, the library of some of the most profound speeches that you get, of course, at the end of something like Black Thursday, where so many were lost, um, to just take a moment and recognize the um, the value of what they did. I think that's such a beautiful speech. Um, so yeah. You can just and, imagine and we how get these, back, those hearing it to, felt. Yeah, to early 1943. I mean, these men were doing it out of patriotism at that time. You know, they it was strictly patriotism. Yeah. And but I think the military brass also knew there was a limit to that too, um, mm-hmm. and I you know and I think that's why this particular mission you know changed the outlook, changed how they did things um, from here on out. That's a good point. That that's a really good point because to have such a devastating Thursday, yes. um, they were able to step back and go, okay, they have early warning, you know, radar now. They they took us out with all of their Luftwaffe. We didn't have the escorts that we needed, and they changed. And, of course, we won the war. So yeah. um, sometimes we have to, and I think this is just a lesson in life. Sometimes our worst days, like a Black Thursday, can lead us to our triumphs mm-hmm. and our successes. So even though there was so much loss, um, it definitely allowed them to make the changes that needed to be made. And maybe they wouldn't have made those changes, and who knows how long it would have taken for, for those changes to be adopted and yeah. the, and the effects of them to, to be seen. You know what I mean? So I think we one, can look one thing at it. Just on me, um, mm-hmm. you know, black Thursday was very much like, um, D day was for the infantry. Mm-hmm. You know, that day that went down memory. And if you were in the um, air corps, mm-hmm. it was black Thursday. I like it when you make those comparisons and earlier comparison you made was that the flak was kind of like walking through a minefield for those that were on the ground. And that is very interesting. I wonder if that comparison has been made before, but I think that's really, uh, it helps put that event into perspective um, and really gives honor to those that that participated in it because we certainly honor those who fought and died on on D-Day, you know, not to say that we're not honoring those on black Thursday, but, but just knowing about them and thinking of them that way is part of honoring them. I think that, um, we need to make sure we're giving enough recognition and and gratitude to those who, who fought in, in all of the different types of warfare that were part of that, of that time. Well, the last few chapters of a boy from Cracker's neck we've discussed on triumph talks have been some of the darkest times for the bomber crews during world war II. But the next episode will contain both a Hollywood ending, Hollywood type ending that really happened, and some humor (laughs) from a chapter titled The Americans Are Coming. So if you're enjoying this channel and the stories that we're sharing, please be sure to like the show and subscribe. Maybe share it with anybody else that you know is a war buff because they may really enjoy hearing these first person accounts that John is sharing that his papa gave him. And um, we'll look forward to having you watch the next episode, which will be up on the screen. Thank you.